table with the student, sign up for a time to visit with Amelia, put your cell phone number down, and we'll text you when she can visit with you because we anticipate having several people wanting to visit with her this morning. So there's a sign-up sheet. During the course of the day, you're going to hear stories from veterans. Some of it is very traumatic. I mean, when we send our men and women on deployments, they see the brutality of war. And you're going to hear some of those descriptions today from veterans as to what actually happened to them. I want you to feel free to leave the room. If it's too much, if it's too emotional, if you don't want to hear it, please don't worry about leaving quietly. We don't want you to have to listen to anything that you don't want to do. So that's all I hope I have to say because we have wonderful speakers and the students are introducing everybody to you. So thank you for being here. First, however, if you're a veteran or related to a veteran, please stand up and let us thank you for your veterans, right? Um, I want to apologize first. I moved to Florida about two years ago. Has anyone ever lived in Florida who wasn't born there? <laughs> There's allergies. Nothing dies there. <laughs> so there are allergies and mine are particularly bad. So I apologize if I, if I go hoarse or something else horrible happens. Um, so just so I can get an idea of who's here, can you raise your hand for me if you're an attorney? Oh boy. Yeah, no hecklers in this crowd, I'm sure. Okay. Um, what about if you're medical professionals? A couple. Okay. Um, people who are interested in this topic? Okay, good. All right, that's awesome. Um, so I realize I'm the warm up speaker for this because you've got a lot of really powerful speakers this morning, um, all of whom know a lot more than I do, right? I'm not going to kid myself, I'm just a law professor. So. <laughs> My job is to talk to you about traumatic brain injury, in, in particular with service members. And I, um, Angela, Professor Drake asked me to talk about an article that I've written recently that was published, and I wrote it with a forensic psycho psychiatrist and a neuropsychologist. The neuropsychologist does traumatic brain injury testing, the forensic psychiatrist um, does PTSD testing for my clinic. So I run the clinic at Stetson University College of Law in St. Pete. Um, in that clinic, we this. We help veterans with their disability benefits, much like the clinic here at Mizzou does. 
right? Because of my background as a JAG attorney, we also do medical retirements for veterans. We do discharge upgrades as well, and we'll talk about that a little bit this morning. Um, and mostly we're just about information, getting out there to, to um, the community. How many of you are staying for the CLE this afternoon? Good, awesome. So the reason that I got into this work, and I think it's probably important for you to know what my perspective is, and why I'm talking to you about what I'm talking to you about, is when my husband and I, both JAG attorneys, got off active duty, and Professor Drake loves the story, my husband hates it because he says it makes us sound like bad lawyers, right? But <laughs> when we got off active duty, he had some significant injuries because he had been something before JAG. We filed his disability benefits and we screwed the whole process up, right, from beginning to end. We messed it up entirely, missed our deadlines, um, couldn't figure out what the VA wanted from us. And so after it was over, we thought, geez, two JAG lawyers can't figure this VA process out to hand. Right, so we decided to start the clinic at William and & Mary. And in 2014, I went to Stetson. So I appreciate and applaud those of you who are staying this afternoon to learn how to help veterans through this process. Because while it's meant to be easy, obviously our story is an example of how it's not. Right? So, because I'm the first speaker, I'm not going to pretend we all know what I'm talking about. So let's just start with some basic definitions before we go through this. Traumatic brain injuries are something that affect the brain, obviously, right? And they're from an external source, usually some type of force to the head. We're also going to talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder, and I know that there's a speaker I'm pretty sure this morning as well who's talking about that. So there's, there's some... Um, discussion about whether PTSD is actually a disorder. I understand that discussion, um, but for today we're going to use the term PTSD because that's what people call it, right? But that's, that's a reaction to a traumatic event, a shocking event that has lingering symptoms, right? So particularly traumatic brain injuries in the military. It's estimated that between 2000 and 2014 there have been a little over 321,000 reported traumatic brain injuries to our service members who have deployed. There are about 2.5 million service members who have deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. This is about 13% right, of that number. Um, <clears throat> now, 83% of those are considered mild traumatic brain injuries. So when you talk about brain injuries, particularly with the VA, right, they, they are listed as mild or moderate or severe. And mild traumatic brain injuries are, are usually ones that resolve within three months to a year, and they don't cause lasting effects to the brain. And I'm sure the docs are going to do a much better job of talking about that when the keynote speaker comes up. Remember, I'm just the lawyer. I'm not going to pretend to be the doc. <coughs> That's why I ask the doctors for their opinion, right? Um, but you can see 83% of those are mild. If it's a moderate or, or severe traumatic brain injury, usually that person in the field in combat is going to be medevaced somewhere else because something's wrong. Like you can tell something's wrong, right? With the mild traumatic brain injuries, which you'll hear about this morning, sometimes you can't tell anything's wrong, at least not physically. So when we look at Iraq and Afghanistan vets in particular, they are having mild traumatic brain injuries at what is estimated to be 15 to 30 percent of them. So 15 to 30 percent of those who deploy are coming back with mild traumatic brain injuries. I'll tell you why it's an estimate in a minute. So a lot of times when I talk about TBI and service members, everyone's like, well, why, does, why now? Why are traumatic brain injuries happening now to our service members? Well, first, they're being exposed to explosions, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of vehicle rollovers in the military. You've got those heavy vehicles, not just in <coughs> combat, in theater, but also on an installation. That can happen as well when they're, when they're comments in the United States. We've also got incendiary explosive devices that are put on the roads in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're buried. When our vehicles go over them, sometimes there's a hair trigger. Sometimes it's detonated by a terrorist who's watching the American vehicles go over them and they explode with our service members inside them. The reason that we're seeing these events cause traumatic brain injuries is because of the, the body armor that our soldiers are now wearing, and I'm gonna use soldiers and Marines. There are other service members who have suffered from TBIs, but the Marines and soldiers are our ground forces, and so they are the majority of the people who've suffered. Um, so don't feel bad if you're from another branch, I'm not trying to disenfranchise you, right? It's not just the Army and me. 
Um, the, but the body armor's changed, and so is the armor in our vehicles. So just as a reminder, right, here's our flak jackets. Did anyone wear those in Vietnam? Yeah, right? So not a lot of protection. Uh, we started wearing them in World War II, and by Vietnam, they actually had some type of neck protection. They were mostly for penetration, bullets, grenade fragments. These are the new types of body armor that are out there. They have ceramic shells around every part of your body. Right? When I was getting ready to deploy to Iraq, they didn't offer JAGs any body armor because they thought, well, nothing's going to happen to you guys. This war is going to be over in two weeks just like the last one was. Um, so not everybody who deployed in those first few years was even offered body armor. But they also have the groin protection and the neck protection. So things that would have killed our service members in previous conflicts are not doing that now, and that's great news. But what that means is our current service members are suffering from effects of these explosions and IEDs that they wouldn't have had in the past. And so that's why you hear the traumatic brain injury is the signature wound of this war, right? And it's something that the DODs had a problem coming to grips with. So in the field, right, when there is an event that could cause a traumatic brain injury, DOD realized they weren't doing a very good job of figuring out when someone might have one, especially if it's a mild traumatic brain injury. Again, if it's moderate or severe, there's probably something else wrong and they're getting medevaced out of that theater. So in 2012, DOD standardized traumatic brain injury evaluations across DOD. Now, how many of you are veterans again? Oh, quite a few, right? So you know when DOD standardizes something, that's not true, right? <laughs> right? It's kind of like the VA. No offense to our DRO who's here. Um, but when they say this is standardized across DOD, that's not necessarily an accurate statement because I know a lot of veterans who did not get any of these evaluations in the field and should have. But when there is an event that could cause a traumatic brain injury, they're supposed to do something called a MACE assessment, which is the military acute concussion evaluation. And the commander does it sometimes, or the medical person on the scene. And they look to see by your orientation, your concentration, your cognitive abilities at the time. If they note something is abnormal, <coughs> then they will refer you on to medical. If you look okay, then you're just gonna be put on mandatory rest, right, to, to make sure that everything is fine. Um, the, the PDHAs and PDHRAs are also a tool that the DOD uses to figure out if something might be wrong with a service member. So a PDHA is a post-deployment health assessment. Before you deploy, they give you a health assessment. How are you sleeping? How do you feel? Do you have any anxiety? Do you have headaches? And then they give you one when you come home. And it's supposed to be within a few days of you returning back to the United States. That's hit or miss. Some of them take it while they're still deployed because the command just wants to get it over with, right? Um, the PDHRA is done 180 days after they come back from deployment. And it's mostly used to find out if there's lingering mental health issues going on with those service members that need to be addressed. But this is where the soldier marine fills this out, right? And a medical personnel person sits down with them, a doctor maybe sometimes, a nurse, and says, okay, it looks like these things might have happened to you. And it asks about, were you exposed to explosions? Do you have headaches? Are you a problem sleeping? Things like that. And that's where the medical personnel are supposed to figure out if there might be an issue with a returning veteran and traumatic brain injury. The VA also implemented mandatory screening of anyone who goes to get treatment at the VA in 2007. Have any of you been to the VA and experienced this <coughs> testing? Probably not. I've never heard anyone who has, and it's mandatory, right? So take that for what it's worth, but there's supposed to be something there to screen for traumatic brain injury. Notice that this is 2012, that these things were implemented for DOD to find out about traumatic brain injuries in the field. You have over a decade worth of veterans who could have experienced a mild traumatic brain injury and no one knows, right? Which is why they have to estimate how many of our combat vets have actually experienced this condition. So what I actually want to get to the meat of is undiagnosed traumatic brain injuries because I really think that's going to be the issue for our veterans going forward. Um, so 
they estimate, so there was a study done, right? And I say they, the researchers, the scientists, the medical professionals. Um, between 2003 and 2010, they did, they did a survey of all the veterans who served during that time in Iraq and Afghanistan, all the active duty veterans. And they estimated out of the survey results that there were over, I mean, almost 33,000 returning active duty <coughs> veterans who had unreported, undiagnosed traumatic brain injury. What they did not include in that study was the over 650,000 reservists and National Guard members who had deployed. Right, so that number could be significantly higher than what they're reporting. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of different reasons that they're undiagnosed. First, it could have happened before 2012, and even after 2012, sometimes it's still hit or miss if they're getting the right testing. The symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury, which we're gonna look at in a second, can be symptoms that healthy people have walking around. So sometimes it's not really easy to tell that there's a traumatic brain injury going on. <laughs> the issue of lost diagnoses, anyone who's worked with somebody who's served in Iraq and Afghanistan, they could be diagnosed in the field with a traumatic brain injury, and that never makes it to their file, right? The, the military and the VA are having a lot of issues with medical records making it into files, so there really could be a lost diagnosis somewhere or one that's missed. And you really have to, to be aware of that and look through all the records for it and ask your clients, right, well, did, did they actually do a test on you to find out if there might be results hiding somewhere, not in their file. That PDHA, that post-deployment health assessment, that can be a failure, and we'll talk about why, um, but medical professionals not catching what they should catch. Commands, <laughs> anyone who's ever worked with a command before, and, and my husband says a lot, that the best thing you can do as a JAG sometimes is to protect the soldiers from their commander. Right? Because sometimes commanders are myopic. I've, I've, got a, I've got a high operation tempo. I've got to get back to Iraq and Afghanistan with this unit. If you are a problem, you are off my books. Right? So especially before 2012, this was happening a lot, where these guys were jettisoned from their units. There's also a failure to report on behalf of veterans, and that can be for a variety of reasons. And there's this comorbidity factor, right? Comorbid symptoms. When PTS or when TBI is sitting next to something else and mingling with it like post-traumatic stress disorder, it gets hard to figure out what's going on. And sometimes the symptoms of PTSD can overcrowd the symptoms of traumatic brain injury, <coughs> which means the TBI never gets treated. So there was a study that just came out last month, or a end of September, um, and the NPR reported on it, and so did a number of other places, and the doctors know a lot more about this than I do, but they said that Finally, what everybody thought was true is being proven through research that if you have a traumatic brain injury, you're more likely to, to suffer from the symptoms of PTSD. You're more susceptible to it. And that's tough because here are the symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury, some of them, not all, right? And these, again, are symptoms that, that you or I could have totally without a mild traumatic brain injury. I, I will tell you I am periodically irritable, as my husband will agree. Right. But here are the symptoms of PTSD. And you can see that there's a lot of overlap. And again, there are more symptoms than this, but these are some of the main symptoms. So sometimes PTSD can be more readily diagnosed than a traumatic brain injury, and that can go untreated. So why is this a bad thing for our service members? Well, they get no treatment. That's not helpful. Um, this can lead, undiagnosed mild traumatic brain injuries can lead to misconduct. So there was a study done um, in the UK that found that combat veterans with mild traumatic brain injury are two to three times more likely to have alcohol and drug problems. And alcohol and drug problems can lead to bad things, especially if you've ever been in the military. It can lead to you being kicked out of the military, which we'll talk about in a second. It can also lead to violence, particularly domestic violence. Right? Because you've got poor judgment. And not every traumatic brain injury occurs like this, but these are some of the pitfalls if it's untreated. And it can lead to these bad paper discharges. So you get in trouble in the military and they're going to kick you out. And you're going to talk about discharges in much more detail this afternoon with very knowledgeable people. But there are five basic discharges you can get from the military now. Only two of them entitle you automatically to veterans care at a veterans hospital. If you get any of the other three discharges, and that happens if you get in trouble, 
right? That was my job. I'm supposed to get you out of the military with one of these bad discharges. Then you don't get care from the VA. And that's bad, right? So we have a number of veterans walking around with traumatic brain injuries who can't get treatment. And it's been recognized by the doctors who work with DOD. It's called the Military Catch-22, where we recognize traumatic brain injuries are occurring and we're not catching them. We recognize there's misconduct that occurs, but we're kicking you out anyway and precluding you from getting health care from a VA system. And with a bad discharge, you're also probably not going to find a job where you can afford to get health care. So how do you get treatment? Right? It's a, it's a horrible cycle that happens. So the other problems that can happen with, a tra with an undiagnosed mild traumatic brain injury are your veterans benefits, which I was just telling you because these bad discharges, you may not get them at the hospital. Also, it's hard to prove a service connection. And you're going to talk about how to prove that this afternoon, but you have to be able to show that what happened to you in service is related to the condition that you have now. If I have a traumatic brain injury now, how do I prove it happened to me from service? It would help if there was a diagnosis, right? And the VA is not very forgiving about this. You would think that they would be, but they want proof. And if you have no proof, then it's very difficult to get benefits from them. <clears throat> it can also lead to a lack of adequate medical care at the VA if you're not diagnosed appropriately. So we represented a homeless veteran who was a Navy vet. And he was in Puerto Rico, I believe. And he was walking back from dinner. He was totally sober. Everything was fine. And he got hit by a drunk driver. And he was hospitalized. He was unconscious for a number of days. He um, gets out of the military. And he goes to the VA hospital. And because it was never documented that he might have a brain injury, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and medicated <coughs> for it by the VA for 10 years. And by the time we got to him in the homeless shelter, you know, there, there's some things when you start doing these cases a lot. Because again, I'm not the doc, right? I ain't that smart. Uh, so I know there's some, some symptoms that are common to traumatic brain injury sufferers, though. Weird tastes. Do things taste weird to you? Do they taste metallic? Are the lights always bright, even when they're not? These are really bright lights, by the way. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> you know, um, do you have to wear, to wear shades inside, right? Do you suffer from these uncontrollable, random headaches? He looked like a traumatic brain injury sufferer to us. And when I got him to the doctors that I work with, because my clinic partners with medical doctors and their medical students, so the law students and the medical students work together on these cases, they diagnosed him with traumatic brain injury with dementia, not bipolar, right? So you can see how important it is to get these diagnoses correct, because he's been on bipolar medicine for a decade that he didn't need. Um, and then there are other benefits that veterans can get if they have the diagnosis of TBI that are important, and we'll talk about one of them in a minute. So um, I'd like to share a vignette with you, and I was telling Professor Drake last night, this is one of my clients who um, I helped through medical retirement, um, and I emailed him and I said, hey man, <clears throat> if I change your name, can I use your story to dime out the army? And he said, yes, please. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do for a minute, just to kind of show you how the failure of all of these procedures within DOD can prevent or should prevent service members from being undiagnosed in traumatic brain injuries but often don't work right. So this is Staff Sergeant Jones. He's in the United States Army. He's been on active duty for about six years. He has great evaluations. Top, top of the line, NCOARs, Non-Commissioned Officer Evaluation Reports. His command loves him. He deploys to Iraq, and he's there for most of 2008, and he's assigned to the 2nd Striker Brigade in Taji, Iraq. So Taji is near Baghdad. Has anyone been to Taji? I have not. Okay. So it's in the Sunni Triangle, is that right? Okay, and that's a pretty, pretty hostile place, yeah? Okay. There's a lot going on there. Um, and this is what a striker is, if you're not familiar with it. It's these armored vehicles. And this is what they look like inside. So our service members are kind of pecked in there like sardines, right? And here's another view of that. And then here's a view of one that has been hit by an IED, has run over one. So he's involved in an IED explosion in 2008, and it's one that is in the road and is set off by a terrorist who's watching what's happening and hits his transmitter to make it go off right as the first 
um, vehicle in the convoy is going over it, and that's Staff Sergeant Jones's. Nobody in Staff Sergeant Jones's striker is killed, thank God, because that could be one of the results of these IEDs. This one was not, I guess, as powerful as the other ones, but there was some significant knocking around of the soldiers inside that convoy. So he hits his head, he's wearing his Kevlar, everybody is, right, the big helmet, and he hits his head on the metal inside, because they're all just strapped right in there together, and he sees stars <coughs> and he blacks out, in his own words, and he says that from the very beginning. The fellow soldier, one of the fellow soldiers who was in that convoy with him, because when you're the lawyer, right, nobody's getting these statements from the people who are around when these things happen. You have to go back and recreate this stuff. A good way to do that is to try to find the soldiers or the Marines who were with your client. And Facebook is wonderful for that. If you're not on Facebook, make a fake account and find these people. <laughs> because that's what we have in our clinic, right? But even the soldier says he, he had scrapes all along his helmet and he did not seem like himself. So all of the soldiers in that unit or in that striker have massive headaches. And so they go see the medic and like I told you, if there's something obviously wrong, you know, the medic's gonna look at you. Are you bleeding? Are you no? Okay, well, get some ibuprofen and drive on. And frankly, I mean, it's called Ranger Candy for a reason. Ibuprofen is what they give everybody for everything, right? Uh, so, so they get some ibuprofen and they're sent on their way. We get a statement from his platoon leader, who's now a captain after the fact, and he says there was no test in the field for traumatic brain injury at the time, <clears throat> because this is 2008. And when did DoD put those procedures in place? 2012. I think you man. <laughs> you listen, yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> so there was no examination for a traumatic brain injury at the time, right? So we've got two failures already in the system, right? Everybody in that vehicle has a headache, which should be, at least to the medical professionals on the ground, an indicator of something, right? And the second is there's no real examination done of these service members. And trust me, by 2008, DOD knew that traumatic brain injuries were an issue. They just weren't doing anything about it in the field. So then he comes back, redeployment, he comes back to the United States. His symptoms have continued this whole time, everybody in that vehicle still having back problems, headaches. He comes back, remember this was in what, July of 2008, June of 2008, the attack happened. January 2009, he's still having these symptoms. He fills out that post-deployment health assessment when he gets back. And he says, checks, I've been in an IED explosion, I'm having you know, sleeping problems, I'm dazed, I'm irritable, all these things. What he does not check is, I was knocked out. He probably doesn't think he was knocked out, because some people get knocked out, right? He just knew he'd lost consciousness and saw stars for a few seconds. So he doesn't check that box. And the medical provider who sits down with him even says, hey man, you know, it's likely he was exposed and may have TBI with persistent symptoms. But guess what doesn't happen? He never gets referred to anybody else for any treatment or any follow-up care. And this happens a lot. So this is one place where you want to look for information are those returning deployment questionnaires, right? So there's another failure in the system. He gets back to his command. And remember, this is a stellar soldier. He's getting excellent NCOERs. He gets back to the same command he was with before he deployed. He deployed with him. He comes back. He's getting marginal ratings. That's not good. Anyone who's been in the military knows that this is a bad indicator. Something is happening, and the command does nothing. They decide to PCS him, to get, get rid of him, send him to another unit. So they send him to the old guard in January 2010. The old guard, if you're familiar with it, is at the cemetery in Arlington, right? And they're the ones who do those very dramatic, practiced, measured burials for our service members, right? <clears throat> By January 2010, we're already a year and a half past the incident that occurred. He earns the nickname Crazy Joe from his subordinates. And already, this is an indicator things are not good, right? One of his fellow soldiers, if you can't read it, says he was like an adolescent child. He'd talk to us and get lost in mid-conversation and wander off. It was kind of sad, we all respected him, but we joke to keep him from being embarrassed and we call him Crazy Joe. He would have severe headaches forget things, lose focus, and space out completely. This is a mid-level non-commissioned officer in a unit that's known for its precision, and he's having these issues, and guess what the command did? Yeah, nothing. This was his team leader, the person who was in charge of his group, right, at the old guard, 
It would take Staff Sergeant Jones two weeks to learn routines other soldiers could learn in a couple days. He usually had problems. I remember once he went completely in the wrong direction during a funeral procession and then started going in circles. And one of the younger soldiers followed him because he didn't know any better. Right, this, this one makes me want to cry. Right, these problems were the rule and not the exception. So finally, in January 2011, now we're how many years past this event? Two and a half? Past his traumatic brain injury event? He goes in for a sleep study because he's having problems sleeping, which is one of the symptoms of TBI, right? And the doc says, this is not sleep apnea. There is something else going on. I'm referring you to neurology at Fort Belvoir, which is one of our military district of Washington installations. He gets in to see a doctor in February 2012, finally. Right? And he's referred uh, over a year earlier. And they're so backed up, he can't get in to see anybody. And that's where he immediately gets a diagnosis of mild traumatic brain injury. And the, the occupational therapist who's assigned to help him says his, his obvious TBI symptoms, because at this point he's also displaying PTSD symptoms, right? There's this comorbidity, this mix. She says he's got visual impairment. That is not PTSD related, right? Slurred speech. Um, he's constantly losing things, forgetting things, can't comprehend what he's reading. He's zoning out, sleep problems, mood changes, dizziness, tingling in the hands, and ringing in the ears. After a year, thank God, of medical intervention, he's basically cured of these symptoms of TBI. When his medical retirement came around, it was not for traumatic brain injury, it was for PTSD because medical intervention actually helped this person who'd been suffering from this for a very long time. He's a lucky one, right? So in 2012, he gets transferred to the Warrior Transition Unit, which is the fancy term for the place where you put medical soldiers on hold because they can't deploy and they're on their way out, so let's give them their own unit. So the chief of TBI at Fort Belvoir gave us a statement, and he said, this case is just really, it's the comorbidity, it's very complex of all these symptoms. Um, they initially, again, denied his TBI for medical retirement, and then by the time we came up for it again, it was cured, thank goodness, and we were still able to get a medical retirement for something else. But his unit in the meantime, and this is what I meant by other benefits, right? His unit in the meantime, the one he deployed with, had put all those soldiers in that striker in for a Purple Heart, which is the right thing to do, right? And when you have a Purple Heart, there are other benefits that come to you through the state and the federal government. And the requirements for a Purple Heart are that you lose consciousness because of whatever occurred, that external force, that you're restricted from full duty due to those symptoms, and that your brain function is impaired for greater than 48 hours. Well, we know he was impaired for more than 48 hours, right? It was the symptoms of TBI that led to him being transferred to the Warrior Transition Unit, so taken off active, his basic active, active duty duties. And the loss of consciousness he says he's blacked out and saw stars, right? But he did not check the box that says knocked out. So guess what the Army said? First they said, there is no contemporaneous evidence, evidence at the time of the event that you had a TBI. So even though the Department of Defense had nothing in place to look at TBIs for soldiers during that time, they're dinging him because the medic didn't diagnose him with a TBI at the time of the striker event. So we don't know for sure that your traumatic brain injury is from that IED explosion. And they also said, well, you didn't, you didn't acknowledge you were knocked out. So you must not have been, right? So this is just one example, and it's not one where he's having misconduct issues, right? If he was having misconduct issues, he wouldn't have gotten this far in the process. He would have been gone well before he got to this. But it's one example of how all of the, all of the system fails our service members periodically. And that's why we're necessary. So the why, what's the big deal about all this? Is that they're suffering from these misdiagnosed or underreported or undiagnosed traumatic brain injuries. And it's up to us, right, as people with knowledge about this issue, to look out for these symptoms. To make sure that if something occurred that they've been tested for it. Because if it's not tested and it's not treated, over time these symptoms can get much worse. And that's on all of us as a community Right? And as a nation, when we send our veterans into harm's way, we're supposed to take care of them when they come home. And I feel that's one of our fundamental duties, and I'm so blessed and, and grateful that everybody's here to help in that process. So I'm open to questions if you have any. None? Yes, I can't see really well. <laughs> 
And you're going to have to talk louder, I'm yeah, sorry. I've actually got three questions. Oh, uh, the first two are kind of quick, though. Um, so if, uh, if a soldier or marine gets a general, uh, a general characterization of discharge, mm -hmm. um, are they still entitled to VA benefits if yes. it's for misconduct? Yes. Oh, then, okay. Yeah, so a general is a, is a decision by the military to fire you, right, an honorable switch you get when you haven't done anything to work when you show up to work on time. A general is just a firing decision with no punitive uh, attachments to it, right? Okay. And then this might, that might have answered the second question. If, I would like that. Yeah. If, um, <laughs> if you get a chapter 10. Yeah, that's okay. that. Okay. <laughs> if you get a chapter 10, but you get a general characterization of this. So that doesn't happen? No, it did, but it can't happen sometimes. No. Uh, so chapter 10 is a, it's not supposed to happen, all right? So, <laughs> so everything in DOD and VA is what's supposed to happen, all right? Um, so chapter 10 is what happens when your command says they want to court martial you for something, and you say, please don't. I'll take a bad discharge, right? One of those bad paper discharges if you just drop this case. And it's always supposed to be an other than honorable characterization. Now. I have seen, and you'll talk about these this afternoon, the, the form that you get when you get out of service is called a what? DD 214, Department of Defense Form 214, and it has on there what your characterization of your service was. I have seen them before where people give them in court martial, and somebody fat fingered back in the day, right? They're typing, they're not paying attention, and they fat finger in the wrong character of discharge, right? So it, you may have seen a case where they have a chapter 10 and they have a general, but that's not supposed to happen. Okay. So I would go back and check the codes on it. Okay. And then um, my third question might be a little longer. And I don't know if you served on TDS um, or if you ever did any of the court martial stuff when you were in the Army. Um, but using PTSD on the merits of the case, not sentencing, not for mitigation, I, have you ever. Is a defense? Not, not so much as a def I mean, I don't think you can use it as a defense. I don't think so. You know, and, and I'm thinking, can you use it for partial mental responsibility? I don't even know if you can do that. But I don't know if you've seen cases or heard of cases where um, a, an accused puts on PTSD during the merits of their case mm -hmm. to argue, you know, to argue the merits. Um, so I don't know that the military, and somebody else may have a little bit more experience with this, like Mr. Myers over here, he's a former DMJ. I don't know that they're actually, the judges are allowing that to happen during the trials. Um, I know that PTSD has become a big issue before trial for competency issues because in the military, we don't just do the competency to, to stand trial. We also look at the competency of the person when the crime was committed, right? So if there are PTSD symptoms involved, that may affect that competency issue when it comes up before then. But I have not heard from any of my former colleagues that they're using PTSD in the trial as some type of, because it really would be mitigation, right? Or I'm not guilty because right. I've got these issues. Okay. Dr. Know. Graber, I think, might be able to speak to that. Do you have any comments, Dr. Oh, Graber? yeah, you're doing the comments. Yes. I, you know, a lot of times uh, I we've come across that being uh, brought up during the, the what's called a Rule of 706 board, which is essentially that competency hearing ahead of time. But that's the primary place where it's, it's come up. Um, it's just initially about, I guess, you know, sort of knowing right from wrong at the time of the crime has been. Any other questions? Or? I would ask, if you ready to know, we have a client that we're helping who took a chapter 10 <coughs> when he was in Afghanistan, um, and it was during some of the truly worst fighting in Afghanistan and the deadliest times, and he was actually diagnosed with post-traumatic insomnia, which was really PTS while in service. The service medical records show that. And his uh, defense attorney submitted an affidavit saying this gentleman wasn't like, really truly aware of what he was doing when he took the chapter 10. Right. So we're trying to argue to VA that he should be entitled to all of his benefits under what's called the insanity exception, which doesn't mean you have to be like crazy Colorado movie theater crazy guy. Um, it's just you weren't acting the normal way that you are at the time of the offense or at the time you took the child's attack. And we'll see how that works out. Yeah. But it's a fascinating case because he was actually diagnosed in service. And so this is, I, and so I, 
I'm with any new former military or commanders. I have a great word for commanders. I like commanders. But commanders are also, again, very loud if they want somebody out the door. That chapter 10 is the commander's call, right? Um, and at the lowest level of command, and at the command level, all the way up to the community authority who signs off on it, right? So, you know, we had a client who had six years in traumatic brain injury and PTSD in Iraq as well, who comes back. He's using marijuana as a medical self self help, right, to get through his days. And the CID, um, the Criminal Investigation Command of the military, decides that they want to target him. So they send another their informants to him, and their informant says, "I've got PTSD and traumatic brain injury too, man. I'm just going to kill myself if I don't get some marijuana." So what is the center going to do? He goes and gets him some marijuana and just gives it to him. Doesn't make any money off of it, and now he's a drug dealer because they've targeted him specifically, right? Instead of dealing with his symptoms and helping him move on and get out, and now that poor child has nothing, right? No, no health care, can't get a job. He's got nothing. So when you're looking at these cases, right, the command can make it seem very like like the person that you're looking at really is a, a dirtbag, and that's not always the case. Um, and those are some of the things that you have to look for. And again, I'm a great heart for commanders who want to talk to me about it afterwards. We are willing to have that discussion, but sometimes it goes a little bit too far, and they don't take into account what's actually happening to their service member. I, I just want to add here because there is a tremendous amount of resources through the clinics and other places that, uh, regarding discharge upgrades. It's a very hot topic. A lot of people are involved. There's some great resources. Stacy and Angela's clinics uh, are working on them. But they don't know why somebody does. But if you got that young man or woman who comes in these circumstances that the states have been talking about, take a look at the discharge upgrade part of it because a lot of it's happening, a lot of it's going on, and uh, we're having it. When I was on the board 100 years ago, we had a 7% success rate. Now we're up around 30% or more for upgrades. So you got to go down that path to go no automatic upgrade. In your practice, do you see a better relationship uh, with military services as far as medical records between um, VA and military services? You mean that the records are actually being transferred? Right. VA's access to them? So really, where I so the question is about does VA actually get access to these DOD records more easily? Yes and no. Right, they, if the records exist, the VA can get them. But the problem is, there are a lot of lots of medical records for these service members um, from in the field. And I've got a Marine right now, 2005, Fallujah, right? He knew we were trying to find medical records that is in Iraq treatment at the mental health center that is gone. And he apparently had mental health and psychological testing, and he can't find his records anywhere because they didn't make it into his real file. So I think if you get out today, there's more likelihood that those are going to be there. But if you got out in the early, mid-2000s, there are going to be a lot of records missing, and it's not the VA's fault. I will tell you when something's the VA's fault, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're good people trying to do good work. They're, they're overworked and overwhelmed by the number of claims coming in. But that's not their fault. Yeah. Doctor. Just to tag on to that, just so you know, the military and the VA has something called Joint Legacy Viewer in our medical records where we can actually share records back and forth easily. But what i found is a lot of times VA providers don't know about that, and so they're not checking it. So the records actually may be there, but you might get the VA report saying they don't have them, and that might be something to follow up on. That's a good point. Yes, sir? I may mention there are five, five forms of discharge. Yes, sir. What are the five? I know two are good and three are bad. So honorable is the one you get when you've done everything okay, right? Um, the general is the one where they decide to fire you, but you haven't done anything too bad. So maybe one hot urinalysis, right? Uh, one, one medical, or one marijuana urinalysis. There's an OTH, an other than honorable discharge, which is also the discharge you get if you, or it's when they decide to fire you, but it's with punitive consequences. That OTH may or may not entitle you to be a benefit, there's a fight. And the VA doesn't usually like to get in on it. And then the two that are actually from Fort Marshall's are the bad conduct discharge or the JAG Corps, we call them the video chicken dinner. Um, and then there's the dishonorable discharge, and that's for the worst of the worst offenses. And those two are not going to get you any benefits. Right? Yeah. 
right? And for the GI Bill, interestingly, the post on GI Bill, you have to have an honorable discharge. That's one of the few benefits that a general does not have. Right? And we'll talk about them in very detail this afternoon about who is a veteran to the VA. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of correlation do you see between PBI and loss of hearing? Uh, Marine infantry, uh, shoots a 50 caliber, three deployments, and has lost most of his hearing. Right, so the question is about TBI and hearing. So the doctor can probably talk more to that, but I will tell you hearing is the most claimed claim by any veteran, right? Because we're often doing silly things around loud machines. Um, and I, I've been told by an audiologist once that um, the ringing in the ears that occurs also, the tinnitus or tinnitus, right, is corollary to that hearing issue um, and can make things even worse than they normally <coughs> would be. Um, but I don't know that you're right. I'm sure it probably has some effect on hearing, but Doc, do you want to address that? Um, typically, it's not going to have a direct effect on that, but given the incident that occurs that caused the brain injury, it probably had some other loud um, incident to go along with it. It's, it's likely to see it go together. And hearing loss can have all kinds of other effects on other things as well, including processing information and remembering it. So, right, and yeah, it's all kind of, I mean, the doctor's not even willing, bless his heart, he's type of TBI, but he's not even willing to say that TBI will cause this. Right, so you've got to have a doctor who's going to connect that traumatic brain injury to the hearing loss, and you've probably got a better chance of doing that, or connecting it to his service by saying, I shot off loud stuff without hearing protection. Right, and the OSHA standards are interesting too, even with hearing protection, if you compare the hearing issues to what OSHA's protections are, usually the military's not even following those, so that's a really good argument too, because you can get the, the decibel level of those, of those machine guns, they have them online, believe it or not, to what kind of protection should have been provided in the second area, so I've proved a lot. Dr. Wolf might have a comment on hearing loss and TBI. Yeah, we see it in uh, the general population as well, but uh, again, is it the actual brain injury or is it the injuries surrounding it, even in those circumstances, so the direct connection becomes challenging. So I want to hear the veterans talk. I'm sorry. Um, I want to hear the veterans talk. If you want to ask me questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm going to have to talk at 1 o'clock. Um, but thank you for your attention. And um, I'm excited to hear you. Thank you.
and it is um, an honor and a privilege to introduce our next two speakers. Um, Sean Lee is a graduate of the Duke Law School in 2014. He is from Jefferson City, and um, Benjamin Hunsaker is a current client of the clinic. He is from he's from Central Michigan, is that right? But you've lived in Mid Missouri for quite some time now. Um, Benjamin Hunsaker was a vet, was an Army veteran from 2004 to through, through 2009. He served with the 10th Mountain Division, Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2006 through 2007. And uh, Sean Lee, do I just click? I apologize. I am technologically inept. Okay, there we go. Um, sorry about that. So, Sean served with the 10th Mountain Division in Iraq in 2008 and with the 101st Airborne Division in Afghanistan in 2010. And uh, without further ado, I, I'll keep my comments short because I know you all want to hear the veterans more than you want to hear me speak. And they're going to share their experiences, uh, especially relating to TBI and PTSD and um, the after effects of that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, my name is Sean Lee and I served with the 10th Mountain Division from 2004 to 2009 and then the 101st Airborne Division from 2009 to 2012. Uh, now I'm an attorney with Foland, Wickens, Eisfelder, Roper, and Hoffer in Kansas City. And I also participate in a program there called uh, Legal Connection Military Matters through the Kansas City Bar Foundation. They have a network of attorneys who provide pro bono legal representation to veterans on a range of issues. So it, it's a real privilege to be able to serve people uh, with my knowledge then and through my uh, uh, advocacy as an attorney now. Um, that being said, let's get into brain injuries. You know, that is something that is, is or was extremely misunderstood and now we're starting to understand it. We're starting to put together the puzzle of what happened between 2003 when the initial uh, use of IEDs in Iraq became prevalent and 2014. Um, I went over in 2007 to Iraq and the name of the game in Iraq was find the IED before it found you. Uh, the insurgents had found fighting a enemy that was numerically superior, that was superior in technology and air support. They couldn't exactly fight a knockdown, drag out fight with rifles and expect to win. But there was a whole lot of unexploded ordnance all over the country. Rockets, uh, uh, artillery shells, explosive materials. And so they found they could wire these things together, set them beside of the road, and kill a vehicle full of people without really sustaining any casualties themselves. And they got really great at it. They could hide IEDs in anything. They could bury them, bury them under the ground. They could put them on the other side of a wall. There could be an IED built into that room, and no one would know about it. They got really great at uh, uh, disguising them as other things. They got to be small. They got to be the size of coffee cans. The smaller Iranian electronic, uh, I'm sorry, explosively formed penetrators were the size of coffee cans, and they go through a tank. And so, going into this fight, we understood that we had the likelihood of being killed in the explosion, but none of us really understood the after effects of being in an explosion if you survived it. Brain injuries weren't something we talked about back in 2007, 2008. We didn't understand that you could sustain a brain injury from being in an explosion. We didn't have any sort of uh, procedure for assessing a person if they had been in an explosion and had a TBI. So consequently, people got TBIs and never knew what happened to them. My TBI was that way. I was in Afghanistan. A, I drove down the road, good looking road, and then all of a sudden I was in the air and I was disoriented. Um, I, I don't remember being able to see well. I hollered over to my gunner, are you okay? Can you see anything? <coughs> um, and I didn't know I was disoriented. Now, 
now I know I was disoriented because I could look back because I got on the radio and I started shouting over the radio to the helicopter overhead, look to our right, they're in the mountains. We took a lot of fire from the mountains um, and I was accustomed to that. But in reality, that command wire could only have come from a couple miles or a couple hundred mi uh, meters away and that was the village to our left. And so I shouted over our lieutenant to look at the mountains rather than look to the village of our, over our, to our left, primarily because I was disoriented. Uh, after the blast, after the blast, a number of my soldiers in the vehicle were throwing up. Uh, they were tired. They had a lot of nausea. Some of them had ringing of the ears. They have various aches and pains. Uh, one of my soldiers I'm helping with this case right now, he, w he was sitting back. He was reclining back in his seat whenever he was hit, and he had one leg out straight. And what that translated into was his spine was compressed about midway through because he was not sitting up straight and his knee was met, bent backwards. But being a soldier, you are uh, hardened the entire time that you're training into pushing through. You understand you're going into a situation where you're gonna be injured and you know it is your job to continue fighting even though you're injured. So all of us elected to continue that mission that day we walked to a village down the road and we talked to the leader there and the goal was to show that your IED attacks are not going to deter our mission. Um, fast forward a number of years, or, I'm sorry, fast forward about five months and I started having seizures again. I had had seizures in the past and I started having seizures again. I woke up in a helicopter tied to a, uh, tied to a stretcher and I was evacuated to Germany. And while I was in Germany, I realized that I had a lot of symptoms, that I was not my old self. Uh, I found that I was angry, I found that I was drinking more, I found that I had trouble concentrating, intaking information. Um, and and the, the, the story I told last year was I sat down to read a magazine and I had always been an academic. I had always been somebody who loved to read, who loved to uh, take in new information. And I sat down to read something I'd bought in Germany, and I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get more than a couple of sentences done. Um, and the reason being, primarily, was I had about well, over 20 white matter lesions on my brain, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. But had no idea the entire time I was in Afghanistan that I had suffered a brain injury, and neither had my soldiers. The treatment for that is one that is essentially the same as PTSD. Your goal is to rebuild what you had. And, and, and this thing is a muscle you can train. I mean, that's what schools are for. They train people to learn. With a brain injury, it is no different. You are there to assess where the deficiencies are, and you're there to work on getting them better. And so I had the benefit of going to the Fort Campbell Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic, where I went through occupational, speech, physical therapy, psychological therapy, I talked about my experiences. I had a little machine I had to stand on. It would tip sideways. I'd, I'd have to correct myself real quick. Um, I had to try and remember things. They'd repeat or they you know, list off a series of objects to remember. At the end of the session, they would question me on those. And really, it was a, uh, it was a concentrated effort to get me back to my baseline. Um, and my baseline, I, I, I believe I've nearly reached. Uh, I was a little slow, I was accurate, but I was slow with everything I did. That being said, my soldiers didn't get that. You know, the other people that were in the vehicle with me, only one of them, the gunner, got the benefit of a brain injury clinic. Uh, she was talking about other than honorable discharges and administrative discharges. Two of, the vehicle, two of the soldiers in my vehicle got that. They went, and at the end of the deployment, they fought in the 10th deadliest firefight in the history of the Afghan war. The deadliest firefight the 101st Airborne Division has been in since Vietnam. And afterwards, they took a couple of Valium from, they got from somebody to sleep because they were no longer sleeping. And they lost all their benefits over it. So traumatic brain injury is something that has led to people losing their benefits. That's a common case that I run into. Uh, people that had the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury 
and rather than being identified, they were discharged. And that's the and the reason of that is the symptoms don't readily identify themselves. Nobody walks up and says, "Listen, here's the thing. I've got anger, aggression, short-term memory loss, and I feel like I have substance abuse as well as uh, you know mood swings." Nobody walks up and says that. They exhibit those symptoms. It's typically somebody who, quite frankly, looks like you know a bad person or somebody who. Uh, is always throwing fits or just malcontent or complaining all the time or yelling all the time. But the way to identify whether that's from a brain injury or, a P or PTSD or not is looking back into their records. You know, something that I, I know, having been a soldier, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't know if I hadn't been a soldier, is that people take notes on you from the day you walk in to the Army to the day you leave. Your, your reception, your integration, your initial counseling, your physical fitness scores, your rifle marksmanship scores. On a monthly basis, they write down just how they feel about you on a monthly counseling form. You have an annual counselings. You go to regular training events. People are consistently taking notes on you, and those records are out there. I could look back in my own notes. I could look back in my own records, and when I had my brain injury, I, I could look past that, and I can see my performance as a soldier and as a person, and they were pretty high. They were on the road to bigger and better things within the Army, just like any organization you can move up. And I can look afterwards, and I could see a period of years where I just frankly did not make good decisions. And I can see that in my soldiers, too, that I worked with, and my cases. Uh, some cases, you know, I've handled, I've had people come in my door and, and they'll say, look, you know, I've got the PTSD, I've got the brain injury. And you look in their records and from the day they entered the Army, they loved cocaine and from the day they left the Army, they loved cocaine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the cases where you can see a shift. You can see, okay, soldier entered, they did well, they loved basic training, they were on the road to success, went to Iraq, Afghanistan, pop goes the IED or pop goes the experience that causes traumatic, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then after that, problem, 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 problem. So those cases are out there, and I hope that what you take away from this is when you're assessing a soldier, when you're assessing a person who has been downrange, uh, look, for, look, look for that. Look for that shift. Look for that change in who they were, and try and trace it back. The records the National Personnel Records Center aren't going to turn them over willingly. Contact the units, contact their friends, contact their former chain of command, ask them of what kind of person they were like before and after, and you'll find the answer. And then finally, you know, something that definitely made a positive uh, impact on my life was I applied to law school, I got in, and then I got to train with uh, one of the first veteran clinics in this nation. I mean, Professor Drake came in here and really um, created an organization that provides a lot of free services to veterans. I don't know if you all know just how much, but they take a number of cases and these students work on them throughout the year. And not only do they help friends, but they help people like me who are looking to give back a little bit by training us on how to do it. So, uh, you know, I'd like to thank Professor Drake and the University of Missouri Law School for all they've done today. Thank you. I was going to try to get the PowerPoint slide back. Oh, there we go. All right. Hello, uh, my name is Benjamin Hunsucker, uh, as you can see. Uh, I was a lot better looking then. Uh, I was, I joined the Army in, in actually 2005, but uh, uh, I came here to Fort Leonard Wood, did my training, and then I got sent to Fort Drum, New York. And if anybody's ever heard the term Fort Drum, New York, they know it is the most deployed uh, duty station in the United States. So it's just a matter of rotation. 
And so when I got there, I actually got to spend a year there training before I went to Iraq. Uh, I went to Iraq from uh, August of 2006. Uh, it was supposed to be till August of 2007, but they made us stay an extra few months. Uh, I did 15 months in Iraq. Uh, I changed as a person within the first 30 days of being there. I got hit by my first IED uh, in September. And that first IED uh, hit my driver's side door. And it took that whole up armored Humvee and twisted it. And with that being said, I was launched up onto the radio with my head up on the windshield and shrapnel actually went through my door and was stuck in my seat where my head should have been. Uh, so in a way, it saved my life at the same time. I was immediately knocked unconscious. Um, when I came to, uh, I had my sergeant in the seat next to me yelling at me, uh, shaking me. Uh, there was smoke everywhere you couldn't see. Um, I got in another vehicle. We proceeded to head back to our fob at the time. Uh, when I got there, as soon as I stepped out of the vehicle, I started vomiting. Um, so they took me to the medic station. My head was killing. I couldn't focus. I couldn't do anything. Uh, the medic there, uh, or that we have medics, and then we have basically uh, physician assistants that are there at each station, almost doctors. Uh, five shots of Demerol later, my head stopped hurting. Uh, they then proceeded to take me to Baghdad, where I was, I was met back to Baghdad. And while I was there, uh, they did they had a CAT scan machine. They were doing CAT scans, and they were watching the brain swelling go down. Uh, I was getting anywhere from, well, the first day I got three CAT scans, the second day two, and then one, and then they saw that the brain was almost back to normal. But my head wouldn't stop hurting. Uh, two weeks later, uh, I was still in Baghdad and staying in a little medic tent there, but uh, they said, we're going to leave you here on gate guard, we're going to attach you to another unit, uh, see how your head still hurts. Um, and of course, as he vouched for a military family, uh, so I want to be back with my unit. And I said, if that's the case, if my head's not hurting anymore, send me back. And so they did. My first day back out, I got hit again. Um, trouble sleeping. Uh, I was diagnosed with severe uh, sleep apnea when I got back. They said it was not only the airway that was constricted, but something psychological as well that was stopping me. I have nightmares uh, constantly. Uh, I have PTSD. Um, I was hit by a total of three IEDs. Uh, I broke my foot in the middle of a heart attack. Uh, been shot at. Um, the more it happens, the more you start to laugh. I guess this is the only way to get through it. Um, so when I got back, of course, they were talking about that questionnaire that you me on the way back. And all the only thing you're looking forward to when you get back is your 30 days off. And so everybody pencil with that thing and turned it in. Uh, I just recently filed for PTSD. I didn't do it when I left the Army because I was afraid I couldn't be a cop. Uh, I find out after two years of being a cop, I can't be a cop. Uh, my PTSD just doesn't allow me to do it. Uh, so I filed for PTSD with the VA. And the VA, they gave me a 10% rating on my TBI. Just because somebody used the word TBI somewhere in my medical history, I've never had any other treatment before. Uh, so I got 10% for TBI when I filed for PTSD. They turned around and said that all my PTSD symptoms were related to my TBI. So if it wasn't for Professor Drake and Elizabeth Wiles here helping me with my case, uh, the VA basically pulled one over on me. I can't work. I have headaches. Um, that's why I'm standing up here. Most of the lights are facing that way. Um, I've had a headache, headache almost every day this week. They come and they go. Uh, also, I have a, a back injury that I sustained with that at first IED. I have eight herniated discs in my back. Um, and I just don't seem to be getting the help that I need from the VA. That's just the way I feel. Um, 
I've, I've asked for help in numerous ways. Uh, just don't seem to get it. And one of the best places I found was the vet center. Uh, they were able to provide counseling. Uh, I actually was seeing a counselor there long before I even decided to file for PTSD, uh, trying to keep that doorway open for being a police officer. Again. But uh, with the help of my wife, uh, she's pretty much been my saving grace since I've been back. Uh, I met her actually. I, I was doing guard duty for a couple of weeks with a cook, and she introduced me to her friend, and uh, now we're married. Here I am. Uh, <laughs> but with the excitement of the new relationship and the support that she's been, she's the reason why I'm still here. Uh, sad to say that I don't think the VA is that have a lot to do with it. Uh, it's an assembly line, it really is. Not only uh, do I need help with getting the benefits that I deserve, but the hospital care needs help. And we're just not getting the treatment that we deserve. So, any questions? You uh, kind of skipped through it a little bit, Benjamin, but you mentioned uh, checking through the, uh, the post deployment health screening. Um, I just wanted to make sure people understand what you said when you said that. Uh, you skipped through it because you want to go on leave. You want to go on vacation. They give it to you the day you get home. Because if you check a bunch of bad things happen to you, you get redirected. You do. And when everyone else goes home, you get some extra care. And that takes you away from family and friends longer. Now, she had mentioned that there was a 180 day one. Uh, I don't think I've seen that one. That would have been a different story. That'd be a different story. <laughs> maybe after they went home and came back, maybe that'd be a different story. So when people work with veterans, don't be discouraged if you see one that says, hey, I'm all I'm okay. Because people are saying I'm fine so they can go home and get that first beer or be with family that they haven't seen in a long time. Uh, one of the things I also skipped over is obviously I can set night yeah, you can sleep very well uh, over there. And so they were giving me a uh, benefit on this week. I was diagnosed with all these symptoms, the uh, sleep apnea, headaches, um, all that before I was being treated for that while I was still getting there. And nobody put two and two together with your memory. So uh, this, I've never heard of these TBI uh, hospitals or, or clinics. I've never heard of those. Yeah, you know, major combat units like Fort Riley, Fort Campbell, uh, Joint Base, Lewis and Fort, places that have the big infantry divisions that were going back and forth to Iraq on a yearly rotation, they set up these clinics that consisted of a uh, triage team. You had a neurologist, you had a psychologist, you had an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, physical therapist. And if you got enrolled in this clinic, if you got identified with a TBI, they would enroll you in this clinic each team member would assess you, develop a care plan, and then you graduate after whatever number of weeks it would take you to get back to a, a maximum medical improvement. And see here, with the TBI being listed in my record, I've been through two screenings where you play with a bunch of puzzles and they ask you to remember things. Um, I do have memory loss. They clearly see it has been documented. Some of my other stats are extremely high. I always thought I was pretty smart. I feel a lot number now, but uh, and so they never really thought much about it. Uh, they said yes, you have short-term memory loss. Uh, so that was just another symptom that's been diagnosed. Uh, some medication for your headaches. That's the amount of care I've received from TBI. There are things that worry me out there because you hear the things about football players. Alzheimer's and everything else, and I don't want to put my family to that. You know, hopefully they come up with a cure for all that before I get home. So, um, but I'm afraid of all those future things that I'm going to have to deal with that I'm having a hard time surviving now. I couldn't imagine more hospital bills. Uh, Try to support my family.
follow us to uh, get back to support veterans in whatever ways that we can. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did have a, another question for Sean. Basically, you emphasized last year, and I think it would be important for us to hear more about how you actually accommodate or compensate for your disability and then are able to carry out your current life roles. Yeah, so uh, something you learn at these brain injury clinics and through the uh, associated uh, psychological counseling is management techniques. Uh, I know that if you tell me to be someplace tomorrow at a certain time, I gotta write it down. I mean, I know I have to write it down. I'm not gonna remember it, I'm gonna get the time wrong, I'm gonna get the place wrong. So something I learned early on is take notes down the second that I hear them. I know that I have to do that to code. And so you're looking at my calendar here. Uh, my notes were on there, I was reading off of it. You know, your average person can uh, memorize a speech the night before, but I know I have to have a guide. I know I have to have an outline. And that, that's a little bit of a disadvantage, but only if you don't incorporate it, incorporate it into your life regularly. Um, something else is the ability to focus. You know, I know that there are things that are going to take away my ability to focus. For instance, if I'm not eating right, or if I'm not exercising regularly, or if I have um, uh, uh, too much on my work plate, I'm not going to be able to step up to those tasks. So, you know, I try and live a healthy lifestyle because that is what enables me to be able to do the things I'm, I'm doing. You know, if, if I didn't, I wouldn't be as efficient. I wouldn't be able to do my job as an attorney because, frankly, this thing runs off of this thing. Sean, I don't know if everybody appreciates, you graduated law school in two and a half years, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's remarkable. But as, as an instructor, I can tell you, um, there were challenging moments. She gave me my only A. <laughs> but there were things like, for testing, you know, Sean needs a quieter space. And a little more time. Time, time and a half on tests, too. Yeah. I don't promise things. Another thing you mentioned a year ago, which I'm going to just bring up for you, for you to talk a little more about, is when people have a hidden disability, there is always a decision whether to be open or not about that disability, especially people that one works with and collaborates with. Last year, you talked about being very open about your disability and receiving support from your fellow lawsuits certain times when you needed that support. You, you know, comment about that? that? I remember that very clearly as a person with a hidden disability who also has worked with people with disabilities. Your fellow law students yeah. might want to comment. My fellow law students endured a lot. <laughs> and frankly, I, I was a personality when I first came in. I, I felt like I was one when I came out, but more manageable, more tolerable. You know? <laughs> Some of the things I said in the first year, going back, I'd rephrase them just slightly. Uh, but that being said, that plays into the symptoms, you know? Saying things that are, are, are out of place. I feel like I'm, I'm speaking pretty clearly, I'm speaking appropriately here. But maybe four years ago, I would have thrown a couple of cuss words in, I might have thrown in a story about me and my buddies out. Uh, at some bar doing this, that, and the other, and frankly, it wouldn't, this wouldn't be the time or the place. But, you know, I wouldn't recognize that. I wouldn't understand those social boundaries. But yeah, University of Missouri law students and the faculty, they were, they were wonderful. They, they, uh, I brought a service dog to the class. Uh, they, they accommodated my, my time and a half on tests. They accommodated all my questions. Um, at, the time, at times I was outspoken and they accommodated that. Um, and then to this day, you know, I still email Professor Drake with questions and, and she's still a great help. Um, but that being said, that's not always the case out in the work environment. The folks around here aren't depending on me for a paycheck or a winning grade. You get outside in the work environment and suddenly these things become a liability. They can cost you cases, they can cost you uh, finances, and some employers, frankly, aren't going to put up with it. One, they'll find out about it and terminate you. Or two, they won't hire you in the first place. I mean, you can't throw on a resume, hey, you know, I'm qualified in this, 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 and this, but 
I was kind of a B student in law school, took a time and a half on tests, and I approached short-term memory loss. You know, you're not going to get a lot of tests, or I'm sorry, you're not going to get a lot of job uh, interviews throwing that on your resume. So I was able to be open with it here, but frankly, I, outside of here, we're just not caught up yet on how to manage people with mental conditions. See, I haven't, uh, I went to college for a while, and, and I'm actually very close to finishing. Uh, but I've been very close to finishing now for five years. Um, I can't read textbooks. I can't read articles. Two sentences into it, my mind's going somewhere else and I can still be reading. And I have no idea where or how, and I've tried rereading it. I mean, when you're rereading the same page four or five times over, it gets really difficult and frustrating. And uh, has, I haven't had any skill training on how to deal with things like that. Uh, I did notice that online classes versus uh, classroom environment, I could take in what the professor says, but I can't read the book. And so that's kind of the only way I've made it that far. Um, it is very difficult. Um, I tr retrace my steps. Probably about 25% of my day is just me retracing my steps. Uh, I do a few odd jobs here and there when I can. Um, I always forget I walk into a room, you get that feeling you walk into a room, what did I come in here for? I get that 10 times a day. And it's, it gets a little little difficult. There was another question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I heard you say um, that you were not aware, I guess, of the clinics and the programs that, sorry, what's your name? Sean. Sean had gone to. What do you, do you have a suggestion of what, how would be better, or how to better inform veterans about the programs, or where could you have gone do you think that would have? I went right to the VA hospital when I got out. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a job, didn't have medical insurance, so the VA was the only place I could go. Uh, so nobody at the VA hospital has recommended any of these other places. I didn't even know they were out there. I've been with the VA hospital, I got out in 2009, so I've been dealing with it for seven years. It, it's important to note that the VA, for a number of years, they would assess whether had a, somebody had a brain injury by having a nurse fill out a form for them. And then they would deny or accept all of that. So somebody may come in to you and say, I was in an IED blast, but the VA denied my uh, application for brain injury uh, treatment. And you can look in their records, and a nurse will have told them no. You send them back, get a CT scan, and find some white matter lesions, and then, boom, you got a case. But they should be doing that in the first place, not denying people based on a form. But they have that, so. Sean, just a follow-up. How did you get plugged in to the medical care? Plugged in? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just trying to figure out, as, as a person uh, just coming into this uh, for the first time in this conference, how you have plugged into medical care and how he did. You're both veterans? Yeah. Right. All right, is so. It, is it a rank issue? Like, no, it's right? the government. Things are not exactly always in line there. <laughs> you know, people fall through the cracks and they're, they're okay with it. So I got medevaced from Afghanistan for a massive seizure. I mean, uh, uh, I, I remember going to my tent, so telling my soul, my, my uh, superior, uh, my supervisor that I felt, you know, like felt bad. I woke up in a helicopter. I got home. They knew my history, um, and then I reported on there I'd been an IED blast, and they had a CT scan done. My point. That's how I got gold. The rest of the soldiers just they fly home, and if they report it, then that's one thing. But it doesn't automatically enroll you to be assessed, or at least it didn't. I don't know if they do it now. But between 2004 and 2010, when I, 2011 when I was there, he didn't automatically enroll you. If you check the box on the form that says I have an ID on your way back through, then you had the option of going to a TBI clinic. But bear in mind, I, I didn't know I had a TBI. They, they scheduled some My soldiers, they suspected something was wrong, but they wanted to go home. You know? So they checked the box, the box on the form. They didn't elect to go get a thorough evaluation by this TBI claim. Plus, they were all in trouble for having taken a value of sleep. So they were in the midst of getting kicked out. They were trying to say, look, I've got something wrong with me. But the Army was already kicking them out of the door. Question up there. No, this is for you then. Did nobody, sorry, did nobody tell you that 
tell you uh, about the eight minutes before you got out? No. So no. you didn't have to like that? Um, I, I, well, but you go through an out process, these uh, uh, medical hold in the Army, I didn't get the uh, privilege of that. My commander thought it would be more useful uh, sitting in his office until the day I left. Um, you go through classes, they tell you about benefits that you might be entitled to, how to get in touch with your local people, and things like that. But other than that, it's all, you know, you get some resume classes and things like that, but they're fast-tracking people out. And so, you know. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I was just wondering because I didn't know uh, I'm about myself. So I, I out-processed and they went to me and they were like, hey, if you want your paperwork filled out for all your VA stuff here, I went to the VA or the hospital. And they were like, did you have your medical records? Yes. And they like, I didn't know if you could get uh, I did a pre-evaluation for VA benefits before I left. That was it. A medical evaluation. I didn't even get the results until after I was here uh, out of New York. psychologists they use for people going to criminal trials and in that I had to disclose my, my, my entire life my experiences overseas how I uh, deal with it plus my VA medical records and followed <coughs> by a hearing so you know there are repercussions for getting treatment you know people still see PTSD as this thing where you know it's a liability Employers see it, states see it, uh, and veterans are right in, in not wanting to have that stigma attached to them. Make sure that I 
as best as I could, and now I actually am the service coordinator for this clinic. Um, so this is Dr. Christopher Wool. He is the director of the TBI program at Rest Rehab, Rest Rehabilitation here in Columbia, Missouri. He's the director of the physical medicine and rehab clinic, and he's a board-certified physical medicine rehab doctor physician with subspecialty in brain injury medicine. Um, also an associate professor in Thanks for having me, and uh, it's going to be kind of hard to follow those guys. So, um, But you guys have been sitting for a long time. I want to make this pretty interactive. I'm only going to talk about just the medical treatment of brain injury and uh, in 40 minutes. So we're going to be drinking from the fire hose as it is. I want you guys to feel comfortable just jumping in, raise your hand, ask any questions, because I had to pick out what areas I think might be helpful for you guys to have. Now, I do deal with some veterans. Over time, a lot of that has been more centralized into the VA system. I am in the civilian world, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of both of those, but really the medical treatment is very similar across the board. It's going to be at the coverage level that there may be some differences. And for you guys who have been sitting here for just a couple of hours, everybody can stand up real quick and just stretch out your legs. It's okay. And uh, on my lecture, it's okay to keep out your cell phone. And you can go ahead and text this to 37607 and then you can participate in surveys along the way if you don't feel comfortable shouting at me, throwing things at me, anything like that. This way you guys uh, don't fall asleep during my presentation. Or you can play Angry Birds if you need to, but whatever it takes to get through this, right? So go ahead and get that in there. We'll have that more. You won't be signed up to uh, Wendy's mailing list or anything on this. So go ahead and have a seat. And I'll leave that for just a second. So as Dina said, I take care of inpatient and outpatient brain injury here at University of Missouri. I also take, run the concussion program. So I take care of patients from a very mild injury all the way through to the much more severe brain injuries in pretty much their entire spectrum of their life. Now, when we start talking about TBI, we're going to have to always define it. And for most people in this room, it's defined by what you are. There's a, so many definitions out there, and I put one clinical definition in there. I do take care of quite a few athletes. Obviously, Steph Curry ended up having a better uh, chance after this, but this is one of the more common ones, and it's really close to the Department of Defense as well. Any real injury that causes any period loss of consciousness, of course, any loss of memory, any alteration of mental state, and focal deficits, obviously. We want to consider uh, some of the more mild ones are loss of consciousness less than 30 minutes, obviously uh, so many more beyond that. But when we have actually looked at the data, so for you guys, obviously this doesn't include some of the military, but in the general population, what are the most common causes of these? So what are your guys' guesses on this? So C. An E is in there. And this is somewhat of a trick question because the data is all over the place, right? The most consistent seems to be that the falls and motor vehicle crashes are actually the most common. Falls are skewing the population somewhat. They, in many sources, that's actually the highest because we include the very small children and the elderly. And so they are clumped there. But what we usually think of with brain injury are kind of that great middle there. And when we start looking at the data, the hard part is, how many of you in here are willing to share that you've actually had a head injury? In this room, it's probably quite a bit more. How many of you actually sought medical treatment? That's about, about right. And in this room, I would have expected some to actually be skewed a little bit more toward that. The only way we have the data in the civilian population especially is through the ERs. And so we're only seeing about 2 million through the ERs per year. But then we're anticipating there's about 5 million in our community. And then obviously the, uh, the military system is doing a better job actually capturing some of those. So 1.7 million on average are presenting to ERs in the community. 1.4 of those are discharged the exact same day. No mention of what morbidity may be gone, going down the line after that. Falls, motor vehicle crashes. And we're going to talk just a little bit of pathology. I know most of you in here aren't medical, but this has a lot more to do with what we're seeing. 
because we can't reliably rely on a lot of our um, imaging these days. Our M even our best MRIs don't capture this very well, and especially some of the more mild or anoxic or hypoxic injuries. However, with a traumatic brain injury, these are the most common areas that tend to be injured. This inferior frontal lobe and that anterior temporal lobe, which then underscore a lot of the symptoms that our gentleman who we were just talking actually portray as well. We have memory impairment. We have actual thinking and cognitive impairment. We have the, all of these personality type shifts and changes, behavioral things that Dr. Graver is going to be talking about as well. And so we have all of those are related to actually the pathology that's going on in the brain itself. But the brain is almost a gelatinous mass that's in, inside a very hard swimming pool. So it can get hit against the sides and get these contusions or basically bruising on the brain, but it also can twist and shear and tear some of these little bitty neurons in there. And that's called this diffuse uh, axonal or diffuse traumatic, uh, I'm sorry, traumatic axonal injury where it's just a stretching motion to those areas. Not routinely seen in uh, even some of our best imaging. And that's uh, an example of some of the areas where we see this when we look at it. Typically in the corpus callosum and also the gray white matter junction. Basic high school physics tells us that uh, materials that have more mass or are more dense are going to decelerate a little slower than those other areas. So our our brain has different densities. It's going to accelerate and decelerate at different rates, especially at the moment of impact. And so typically this is what is thought of as that initial loss of consciousness if we have such, and typically happens in those areas, not routinely seen in most of our basic imaging. And if I mention primary, there's gonna be a secondary. So the secondary injury is everything that happens after that moment of impact. This is the area where we're studying a lot uh, right now, especially in medicine, trying to figure out how do we prevent that next cascade. I frequently hear when patients' families are bringing in their loved one, especially the severe brain injured patient, I don't know what happened in the hospital. Mom was talking, she was doing fine, and six hours later, she was on a ventilator and couldn't communicate and never really regains that. A lot of that has to do with that secondary wave of what's going on in the brain. So you get swelling, we can get hydrocephalus, which is fluid coming in at the brain, free radical damage, which is basically just the chemicals in our brain going haywire. We release all the little transmitters in our brain when it's injured, the things that actually signal and are good things later on that I will talk about later, how I supplement those at times, those all get released and actually further that damage initially. And then there are other factors, everything on the right, this, you guys aren't gonna be tested on this, my, my medical students might be tested on it, but everything on the right is everything that's happening in an ICU, trying to prevent those things from adding to the damage. And out of some of the studies that we've been having, actually from some of the studies, especially related to money that's trickled down from football in concussions, has actually led us to a bit more pathophysiology. And the big thing here is that we're discovering this cascade is this self-mediating scale where we really have increased calcium at the cellular level causing further death of the cells. Now, the important thing for you guys is the timing of these. To understand that at the moment of impact, we have a lot of these changes going on. And then in that first five hours has been very critical as well. There we're in the medical field, we haven't figured out a way to target anything in that first hour. If you knew you were gonna get a head injury that day, you would stay home, right? <laughs> so we haven't found any delivery mechanism that can get, prevent that. That is a big factor. However, we're seeing the changes in the brain going on 15 days. And that's where it underscores some problems with uh, some of the return to play if you're talking the athletic side, where we're still seeing changes. There's still a window of potential injury out here at 15 days. However, most of our protocols do look at a more seven day return to play. And so for you guys, I talked about this in general. This is just free. What, what, what's the difference, you think, from what I just said? Is there anybody in here who has any ideas? What's the difference in the military injuries then?
And you can type anything in there and just put it in. Not sure? Basically, there's going to be part of this is exactly the same, right? A lot of that pathology. So some, none. <coughs> the trauma that's associated with it. And secondary, we're going to talk about that a little bit too. Yeah, it's w the circumstances that surround it. And so we do see quite a bit of psychological. We'll talk about that uh, with some of our other speakers here too. I'm going to hit on that, and I'm not naive to it, but we have some really great speakers to talk about that in much more detail than I'm going to. But the PTSD and everything related to that tends to be a bigger issue in that population. Now with the blast injury, we have multiple areas where you can potentially get injured. So we have the primary injury, which is that rapid shift in air pressure, that concussion wave, so to speak. Then the secondary is where uh, basically shrapnel or any objects that are propelled during the explosion are hitting the patient, hitting the person in the head. And then there's tertiary where they're being bodily is, body is displaced, thrown into something, or there is structural, architectural items that fall on top of them. And then for uh, the quaternary is like burns, other injuries associated with that. Just a different set of circumstances is the main thing. The pa basic pathology, what's going on in the brain, is very similar. So what are some of those acute management of especially our mod moderate to severe brain injury? In most of circumstances now, there's early involvement of multiple services. A lot of therapy is being started much earlier and psychology is being initiated much earlier as well. I've been uh, doing this here for about 10 years and over that time, this has gradually, that team approach has grown from just a few handful of people from a trauma surgeon basically on through. And so now we're getting a lot more people involved. We still use uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale as one of our initial scales, very simple scale, to determine and in, in the initial phases whether somebody is mild, moderate, or severe. This can be used throughout the mechanism. It is not, uh, it doesn't seem to have as much reliability, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Graver, uh, with some of the military, because they're not always seen within the time window to be able to make that as a determination. But in the trauma setting, that is what we're still using. So what are the complications? This slide could be pages. Basically, I tell my residents, you can open up a neurology textbook or an orthopedics textbook, turn to any page, and we can probably find a symptom that could be something like that. And I just threw some of the medical things in here. We're going to talk about what this does to the functions of the patient. Hydrocephalus is something that we see quite frequently, especially if they've had bleeds in their brain. This can be delayed and be a source of ongoing cognitive and thinking problems in these patients after their injury. So we can see this months after an injury. Post-traumatic headaches or just really headaches of any type are, are one of our biggest complaints. Headaches and fatigue are huge in this population. As well, hypertension, we have heterotopic ossification, which is bone growing where it shouldn't grow. We have a lot of endocrine abnormalities, which then cause additional problems. Um, you can have cognitive problems just because your thyroid is off because your brain got injured and not sending the signals to your thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. And same thing with testosterone. That can be a major uh, problem with fatigue in this population. Now, how does that work with something like testosterone? Well, you have your pituitary attached to your brain that's really just kind of hanging down in a, a wall of bone. It gets injured, quits signaling below to produce testosterone. And then that testosterone causes fatigue, some cognitive impairment. And so on down the line, we have a lot of different things we're looking at at that time. The psychiatric and psychologic obviously can't be overlooked. The PTSD depression is tremendously high if untreated in the range of 75 to 80 percent. And so that can dramatically uh, cause problems as well. And then the links to dementia, CTE, all of those down the line, that are still, we're still looking at all, not all the connections, but really trying to figure out where, what that spectrum of pathology is. And then I put missed complications 
I know I am a doc, and I'm talking to lawyers, and I'm talking about us doctors missing something, but uh, I didn't miss any of these, no. Uh, but uh, these missed complications, and what I mean by that, if at some point we're trying to keep the patient's heart beating, keep them breathing, and then down the line, these are the smaller, I don't want to say anything smaller, but these are smaller things that now we're recognizing. A patient hasn't really been able to move. Now we get to the point and realize they have a spinal cord injury or they have fractures in different places. These are things that uh, cause increased pain, increased mor morbidity down the line. And then other problems uh, such as uh, spasticity, spasms, that tightness. If you've been in the community or know people who have this, it's really just hyperactive reflexes in their body where they can't relax their muscles. Sleep disturbance, you guys have already heard that today several times. Major problem and also another source of potential ongoing fatigue. And you guys are noticing a pattern. Certain <laughs> symptoms overlap with everything, right? And it makes it much more challenging. Various movement disorders and then swallowing problems and nutrition can follow that as well. But going away from the, the medical part, what about the functional? What does this mean to the overall function of these patients? What does that mean? Any guesses? I'll give you guys just a second and then we'll jump in. So what does this mean to them being... Yeah. That's why I like doing this. You get all kinds of things. Anything else? It does suck. It can really suck for them in a lot of ways. Balance, jobs, family, yep. Life changing. Motor control. This is another slightly trick question, right? It affects everything. And it can affect everything down the line. Relationships, definitely. <laughs> Was that brain injury or my lecture? So there's so many different things, and again, this is not an exhaustive list. Some of the more common ones are highlighted here, fatigue, headaches, irritability, mobility, ADLs, uh, and that's activities of daily living, just the basics. All of these are in there, sleep, wake, anger, personality. Obviously, this is going to affect everything down the line, and we'll talk about well, with the rehabilitation, we're trying to rehabilitate these functional impairments, but in the context of, well, they were a father, a son a mother, a brother, they've had a job. So those are the contexts that we have to put these in. So somebody mentioned balance. Balance is a huge one. That's definitely one of our most common signs in some of our athletes too. Dizziness and headaches are in there, obviously. Rehab, I'm not gonna throw through all of that, but basically my job is that uh, just to assess whatever the residual impairments are after a head injury. Where are the, still the problems? How do we help them get back to whatever activity that is they were doing? Whether that is playing football, whether that is just being a mother or a grandmother, whether that's being able to walk or be able to go through the night without having nightmares. So there's a lot of different things that we're looking at. So we see what's that prognosis, what are their impairments, and then we start initiating as much different rehabilitation interventions that we can find to fulfill their specific needs. And that varies from patient to patient and person to person. For you guys who are in the VA system, this is actually a bit simpler right, in the VA system than what we've got in the community. In the community, we have all of these arrows going in all of these places. And we have acute hospitals, we have EM emergency services, and then we have levels such as acute inpatient rehabilitation, which requires certain requirements to get in. It's our highest level of overall acuity for rehabilitation, then below that is subacute and skilled rehabilitation, residential and outpatient such as any of the various PT and OT places and speech places that are in the community. Now the trick is that this has been regulated like a lot of things uh, in our society uh, ad nauseum and so those of us in the medical field know where the patient should go, however um, we have so many different insurance plans and they all have their own ideas on this. So we fight a lot of battles trying to get the patients to the right place. 
So we do a lot of trying to coordinate, well, how do we get this patient the, mo the best care they can with the plan they have and all of that. So that's a civilian medicine, a different battle. So uh, that uh, is the government and insurance regulation has made that this even more challenging. But there are the highest level of acuity for the rehabilitation that we can get is at that acute inpatient rehabilitation center like a rust rehab or then at the skilled level it drops off but they still get some rehabilitation. Now I was asked to talk a little bit about medication. I'm not going to go into the nuts and bolts of all of the different medications but what we are going to do is run through well, what are my goals? What am I trying to do with these medications? And one of the first things I'm trying to do is get rid of as many of them as, many of them as I can. You heard people talk about some of the problems we have with medication. Sometimes certain of these problems can be basically treated by just invo involving their environment and controlling their pain and getting them sleeping and then getting rid of bad medications. There are a lot of bad medications and what I mean by that is they were needed in that early phase. Now they're causing problems. Even something as simple, somebody would joked about it earlier, ibuprofen is given for anything, right? It is too much and that actually causes quite a few as many headaches as it helps in the longer term because you can get what's called a rebound type of headache and we see that quite frequently one of my <laughs> earliest treatments and patients look at me like I have two two heads when I tell them I'm going to treat their headaches and I'm going to take them off of all of their medication for a week and oftentimes that can help some of the, some of those headaches so what are some of the bad medications? Those of you who are familiar with medications may recognize them. Those of you who are not, are not. The ones on the left can all worsen behavior. And some of those actually are very common trying to improve behavior. And that includes the, excuse me, the benzodiazepines, which includes Ativan and clonazepam and uh, some of those medications that are very common. Valium is in there. But they have rebound agitation and behavior problems. And they also have cognitive impairment. Yes, ma'am. Antihistamines. Antihistamines have an anticholinergic effect. Real common medicine, and those can actually impair somebody's cognition when they're susceptible to it. Now, we don't immediately blame their Claritin, but we try to. If we're thinking of adding medicine, I prefer to take everything away and add back and see what, we're, what we've got left. But yes, very common medicines such as antihistamines are on there. And uh, some of the blood pressure medicines, certain beta blockers that are common in our society for blood pressure can be a problem. So when I'm actually going to treat somebody is we have starting low, we go slow, we do an adequate trial of a medicine. And I do exactly what I was just saying. that We try something and then we see what the effect is and then we try something else. One at a time to try to make sure and we don't want to have them just on every medication we can. It's a very fluid process, meaning I may need to be treating some bad behaviors up front, but those same medications will impair their cognition when that behavior is gone. So I may change this over time. Some of these things on the left, we have problems that I have to hold people back a little bit to help them achieve some of those goals, meaning I want their relationship at home to be better. I want them to be able to be able to be socially able to go to work. We may have to control some agitation, some aggression, some irritability, anxiety, mood disturbance, depression, psychosis, and pseudobulbar affect, which is pathologic laughing or crying, basically inappropriate social cueing. And that's something that can be socially devastating and very irritating to a patient. Um, and then on the right side, this is where I want to augment and stimulate them to try to give them a bit more either alertness, a little more attention, help them with their memory and cognition. And so there's a lot of different things in there. There's a whole scale, I'm going to skip over that for right now, but going through some of these things, agitation, aggression, anxiety, when I'm breaking that down, very simply it is a whole spectrum of things covering from very simple basic anxiety all the way through to very violent and aggressive and we see all of those in there so my my treatment involves much more depending on how bad they are how what type of medicines we're going to use but environmental oftentimes just reducing the level of stimulation we had heard mention earlier about 
additional time for testing, additional quieter time. Those things can help with just straight anxiety, learning, getting the right environment can be there. For my more violent uh, patients that are hurting themselves or others, we have soft restraints, alarms, one-on-one -on -one sitters, having somebody, a patient with somebody right there as a calming voice and not distracting them but who is educated in that. Sometimes we have to use the additional restraints just to keep them from hurting themselves until we get that situation calmed down. And that tends to require some medications, such as these antipsychotics, that are in there. Now, these patients are not psychotic. However, we want to try to protect them, and this is going against what I want to do long term. So up front, we may have to use some of these very common medicines uh, that are mentioned in here to calm the situation down, get them to a focus point, and then come back. Lots and lots of side effects with these medications. And I'm running through the meds because I'm assuming we don't, have, we don't have any pharmacology professors in here, do we? Anti-epileptics to control typically seizures also can, because what they're trying to do with controlling seizures is they're basically turning the volume down on the nerves in the brain, it can also stabilize their mood a little bit. These have side effects. They're less harsh on the cognition than some of the other medications. And commonly I will use these for patients who are going to be in the community. And this is, again, we're talking more moderate to severe. Rarely do I have to use this after a concussion. Some of the side effects here, liver toxicity uh, is a problem. It causes problems with producing blood cells. So there are side effects to everything we do, but if this allows somebody to go back to work, it's worth that, and we monitor this along the way through. Now those medications I said were bad earlier might be good when I'm trying to help control some anxiety when I'm pulling them back a little bit. A medication such as propranolol, which has been around forever and ever, and it works really well for blood pressure, and th that type of stabilization works well on mood, too. And minimal side effects with that one. Now, real, some of the more common medicines I use almost every day are gonna be the antidepressant class of medications. Not only for depression, but they also help with anxiety, at higher doses, it can treat post-traumatic stress disorder and obsessive compulsive disorder, also can help with the pseudobulbar affect. These are very frequent used for these type of patients. We actually do have studies, this is the one time we have really good studies in medicine on brain injury and medication, is with Zoloft. And so it does have some cognitive stimulation in addition to the beneficial effects on the mood as well. Now these are definitely still have side effects. Every one of these has a big black box on the side of increased risk of suicide. And I have to be real cautious with who we choose to do that. Um, the common thought is with this, if you have somebody profoundly depressed and you put them on these, it's gonna bring them to that higher level, maybe. But really, if I have, if I have a patient I'm really concerned about, we do that under inpatient observation as opposed to out in the community. Um, Serotonin syndrome, that has a problem uh, where we get too many of these different medications. I try to just limit the number of medications we have. That's a whole other lecture. And then there's some other issues with these medications as well. The overall depression and then depression and then that pathologic laughing or crying that I mentioned, we have several medications we use for that. Now on the flip side, if I'm gonna try to get somebody more awake and alert, I'll use some different medicines. These medications, none of those are indicated for this. And that creates problems with health insurance at times. Amantadine is an anti-flu medication <clears throat> that works to give people a little bit of cognitive stimulation. We discovered that by accident and we use it in multiple sclerosis but also in brain injury to try to help with cognition. We do actually have good studies on that. And then a Parkinson's medication Cinemet or carbidopa levodopa works the same way. It gives a little bit of cognitive stimulation, a little more get up and go. So for the patients that that fatigue or that cognition is limiting their, their function from doing X, Y, or Z, we may try these type of medications. Side effects, first side effect looks terrible, right? It's usually only gonna happen if they have pre-morbid psychiatric problems. They, had, they may have had schizophrenia, and we didn't know that. 
but for the most part, these are very mild medications. The other stimulants trying to do that same type of thing, Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, the things we put hyperactive kids on, those work the same way, different type of mechanism, but side effects usually about the same with that. And then we have our Alzheimer's medications that we have studied in this population as well. And Aricept, Exelon, and Namenda have different mechanisms, but we sometimes will use that to help with memory. Now, for me in the community, and I do know in the VA too, you, I talked to my colleagues and they struggle with this too, putting a 22 year old or a, even a 40 year old on medications that are only FDA indicated for Alzheimer's dementia is quite challenging uh, to get covered and these are tremendously expensive. Now, so I only pursue this if we are really close to achieving something big, going back to school, being able to stay living in a certain community where we need that little extra cognitive boost. But those medications are out there. And then sleep. Sleep, we have lots of different problems with sleep. Could be they can't fall asleep, could be they can't stay asleep, could be their environment, could be their mind just can't shut it off at that time. And so we have lots of different options for that. I usually will try to make sure that I'm not doing anything or causing anything with any other medicine first, and then try to get them to start sleeping from there. And then with our rehabilitation, I know I'm talking fast. We got just a couple more minutes of me doing this. Uh, we have what we're trying to do is really my whole point of existence with all the minutia we just talked about is to get them back to doing everything that they wanted to do before, within reason. So if they want to get back to work, back to school, stay in their marriage, uh, so forth, we want to try to help facilitate that. So how do we do that? We have a lot of different rehab interventions we can do. Uh, some of our therapists are in the room now. They, they're amazing people who can do an awful lot, but we have to tailor it to what that particular patient needs. And then we have other environments out there, such as vocational rehabilitation, which I think will be hit on a bit later. Personal care attendance. I do a lot of adaptive equipment and home modification, trying to, if we can keep them in the home environment with just some very simple modifications to their home, architecturally, that's a big deal. And then we have driving evaluations out there as well, where we want to try to make sure we have that. In Missouri, we have six months seizure free. Uh, they, have to, uh, they have to be, that's the only real law at this point. I usually put a plug that I do report some of my uh, brain injured patients, and I have to warn them that I do that if they're driving and I truly feel that they're unsafe without that. And again, what we're saying we kind of muddy the water because a lot of this we, we're still talking about, so many of these things overlap. And so if you need help with anything, just find places to do it. Uh, Dr. Hart's going to talk here in a minute, and he and I uh, have a clinic here too. Just make sure you find people who kind of know what they're doing with this if you're confused. There are people, but it, it's such a hard thing to find sometimes. And I know they just won the World Series, but I leave it in there anyway because I'm from St. Louis. So, but questions? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, you guys are both here. One at a time. Um, my question was, I see that it was very interesting all the various types of um, drugs that are being used to treat depression and sleep and things. My, but I've also read that um, exercise can be as effective as a lot of these drugs. And I'm wondering, what role does that play? And should we be looking at that as a partial treatment as well? And how, how do you incorporate that, incorporate that into your I always do. Um, I, just didn't, I didn't actually put it in there. Typically, I have people working with on an inpatient unit. We have them working with physical therapy on an outpatient unit. I have them start working on progressive exercise as well and try to get them back into that real quick. I actually also work with uh, personal trainers in the community on that same purpose, trying to push that because actually there, there are really good studies on exercise. Um, it just didn't fit in with my slide with the meds, but it really. It's an excellent question and an excellent point, but I always do integrate that in uh, almost day one. Thank you. And you have a Yeah, Doctor, <coughs> with regard to the TBI headaches, is there sort of a uh, like a unique 
diagnostic profile for those as opposed to the regular run-of-the-mill headache? Uh, I mean, I assume they start right away and they're more chronic maybe than maybe. To me, there, there's so many different types of headache that you can have with this. And uh, the most common one I actually see has been, especially in some motor vehicle crashes, is this cervicogenic from neck pain. And from the musculature, that is one of the most common causes of it. And once we remove that part of it, we see what's left. I don't see too many migraines just triggered up front unless they had migraines before. And so they don't tend to fit in any uh, real great pattern up front, except for a lot of that myofascial muscular type of headache that comes off very quickly. But uh, you're right, the, the diagnosis of that does become very convoluted. And that rebound headache is one I would not overlook either. Uh, very frequently they start out as that muscular headache. People are taking medicine for a long time. It changes and now it's a rebound type of a headache. Yes? Some of the difficulties diagnosing and treating your patients that have pre-existing mental conditions or diagnosing depression, anxiety. It's challenging. Um, and typically I try to incorporate an entire team. Uh, when Art's going to talk, I do utilize the neuropsychologist to try to help me with that and psychiatrist. And it depends on how badly injured the patient is too because there's selective memory from family members if they're uh, badly injured. And we get kind of this evolving story that they were a saint, but then when we start digging down, you know, maybe they weren't quite a saint. And so uh, we get, it's, you try to gather as much information, but I do rely on uh, our neuropsychologists as much as possible. Kind of following up on that, the military um, it, uh, probably has a higher percentage of people, I say, on the spectrum than um, your average population. And I, I know my particular career field, you know, people know from being a little ASPE. How does that change your treatments? I mean, because it's, they're not neurotypical, I guess. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the interventions are still going to be the same. Where it changes it is in our medication choices. And we have to have a target that shifts for each patient. So I have to be real careful that I'm not trying to treat something that was their baseline, even though we may see it as off of their baseline. So trying to draw where that baseline is very, very carefully, that's where it changes it the most to me. A lot of the physical interventions and therapy interventions don't change a whole lot except with the therapist approach to them, but uh, the medications, I have to be real careful. I know where I'm, where my ceiling is. Any other questions? Thank you guys. Hello.